Ahí en la Ya, ya. It's 4.30, can we start? Jakshi? Oh. Yeah, I'm ready. Is it live on the YouTube also? Yes, so yes, we are live on YouTube and we are recording. We start. So we can start, right? Yes, yes. Welcome to all of you in the last talk of the series. So our speaker is uh, Dr. Ulasa Kodant Ramaya. So uh, Professor Ulasa, he is professor from the School of Biology from Aizar Tiruvannantapura. And also he is a PI of Vanashiri uh, Evolutionary Ecology Lab. He has completed his PhD from uh, Stockholm University and his postdoc research from Stockholm and Cambridge University. His major themes of uh, research areas are the diversification of living organism, pre-predictive -pre 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 interaction, insect-plant co-evolution, phenotopic plasticity, uh, molecular ecology, life history of trends, so in this area, he works and he has more than 60 uh, research articles in, uh, in this area and which are published in the reputed journals. Other than the academician, he is an excellent photographer. And if you want to see the beautiful picture of butterflies and insects, you can visit his web, web page. So today he's going to talk on adaptive phonotopic plasticity. And, uh, he allowed the audience to uh, uh, ask their question uh, when talk is ongoing. So whenever audience do, you do have question, you just put it in the chat box. So now I will request uh, Dr. Rola Sa to please start your lecture. Yeah, thank you, Asha. So let me start with a question. What do you see on the screen? You can type it in the chat box. There are two images, one on the left, one on the right. Any guesses?
Yes. So some guesses saying that it's a caterpillar. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the one on the right here, what I'm pointing at, it's a caterpillar. This is the twig of a plant. This is an oak tree, in fact, this is a leaf. So you can see that the caterpillar looks very much like a branch or a twig. On the left, it's again an oak tree. We have these flowers. They have a special type of uh, inflorescence, a collection of flowers called catkins. And here's one more caterpillar. In fact, these are probably the bite marks of caterpillars. Perhaps I'm not sure. Right. So why do you think caterpillars look like this? What might be the advantage? What might be the function of such color patterns? Well, it, it seems intuitive. If you look like this, you're camouflaged. The predators will not detect you. If they detect you, they may not identify you as a potential food item. So this is assuming that for that particular predator, the caterpillar is a food and the plant is not the food. Obviously, if there's, a, if there's an animal which feeds on plants, then it may feed on the entire thing. That cannot be avoided. So what we're talking about is one type of camouflage strategy or crypsis. So crypsis and camouflage are the same thing. So we're talking about one type of crypsis. There are various different kinds of crypsis. So what we're talking about is called masquerade. So masquerade is a strategy where a prey animal resembles or masquerades as something inedible. So in this image, we have a lizard here. As you can see the lizard, you know, this is the head and this is the tail. As you can see the lizard resembles the other leaves on the same plant. Here, this is a eucalyptus tree. In the middle here, you have a stick insect. You can see the antennae, these must be the eyes. And as you can see, it masquerades very well as a eucalyptus leaf. So obviously here we have zoomed in and I'm pointing out, it's very easy for you to identify the prey animal, uh, the insect rather. And you can, you, you all know that it's insect. Now it's all being told to you. But imagine you're a predator, you're a bird, you're looking for your insect food and you're flying past and amidst all the leaves there's one stick insect. You can see the masquerade is so good. It even has these little wart-like structures which are found on some leaves. That's remarkably good resemblance. So this thing is likely to go undetected. And even if it's detected, even uh, if the eyes of the predator fall on this insect, the predator may not recognize it as a prey item. Here on the right, this is a butterfly caterpillar. Uh, it's found in India also, in the Western Ghats. So this particular species, like a few other butterfly species, during some caterpillar stages or during some larval stages, they resemble bird dropping or fecal matter. So again, imagine you are a bird, you're flying past or you're hopping around amidst the leaves and you see this kind of thing from a distance. You may be fooled into thinking that it's bird dropping, which means it's not food. So masquerade is intuitively very effective against predation. But what is surprising about the images I showed is that both these caterpillars, they belong to the same species. 
In fact, not just the same species. You could take, so this is an adult, you could take eggs from a female moth. This is Nemoria arizonaria, that's called emerald moth. You could take eggs from the same batch of eggs. And you can divide the eggs into two batches. Half of the eggs, you grow them on oak flowers. You let them feed on oak flowers they will grow into this kind of morph. You give them only oak leaves, they develop into this kind of morph. So you don't even need siblings. You could, if you could find a way to clone, you could create multiple clones. And if you could do this experiment, you'll still find that the ones that feed on flowers end up looking like this. And the ones that feed on leaves end up looking like this. So now further experiments have shown that this is related to the tannin content. So if you give them artificial diet with high tannin content, they develop into this kind of morph. So in nature, these two morphs are found in the spring season. So this, the, the flower masquerading morph is found in the spring. This is found in summer. So this is a, a temperate but of, uh, a moth. So here, during winter, these moths are, they're not flying around. So they have two broods. So after the snow melts, after the temperature is warmer, during spring, you have one brood. So these caterpillars, they feed on oak catkins. They grow up, if they survive to adulthood, they will mate, lay eggs, and by that time, it's even it's even more warm. The catkins are not so abundant. The next generation feeds on the leaves, and then you get the summer moth caterpillar. So you have here not only an example of masquerade, but an example where the phenotype of these caterpillars are closely matched to their respective environments. So, so there is a question, yeah. There's a question. So can the one feeding on flowers and the one feeding on leaves mate and reproduce in nature? So I don't know about this particular uh, species. I have not uh, read up literature on this particular species, but in general, it should be possible, right? So if you bring them in the lab uh, and if you somehow succeed in growing them together, if you bring them to the lab, yes, they should be able to mate and you know, uh, have offspring. Only thing is in nature, this morph is found during spring season and this is found in summer. So they may not get a chance to meet in nature. So how did this happen? I said, you can take clones and you can give them different diet. And even if they're clones, when I mean clones, it means that these individuals are genetically identical. Even though they're genetically identical, their diet gives them a different morphology, a different phenotype. This is called phenotypic plasticity. So phenotypic plasticity, it's not just about diet, it's about the effect of the environment. So quite simply, phenotypic plasticity is the ability of the same genotype to produce more than one phenotype depending on the environment. So in this case, we talked about diet. So diet is one component of the environment. So many students tend to forget that the environment contains both the biotic, that is the living component and the abiotic component. So many students think that the environment is only the climatic factors and so on, temperature, humidity and so on. Those are part of the abiotic environment. Uh, from the perspective of ecology, the biotic component is also equally important.
Here's one more example of phenotypic plasticity. This is a butterfly in Africa, Bicyclus aninana. So in the wet season, when there are a lot of green leaves everywhere, the vegetation is green and fresh and so on, the butterflies look like this. On the underside, they have these very intricate circular structures called eye spots. Experiments have shown that these eye spots can protect the butterflies against predation. So if you look at the body of the butterfly, it's here, this is, this is the eye, here is the thorax, the abdomen is hidden by the wings. Here we have the antenna. And this is the most vulnerable part of the butterfly. The wings are needed for flight and so on. But when a bird looks at the butterfly, it's distracted by these very conspicuous eye spots. And as you can notice, these eye spots are found towards the wing edge, wing margin, and they're away from the body. So they're distracted by these and they end up attacking this part, you know, the eye spots. And the butterfly can fly away. The wing is partly torn. Sometimes you get a V-shaped beak mark. The wing is torn, but at least the butterfly survives. So this has been shown experimentally. It's been shown with bird predators. It seems to even work against mantises. This is during the wet season when everything is green and so on. In the dry season, they have this strategy. Eye spots are absent and it becomes very dull and cryptic against a background of dry leaves. So we are assuming that in the dry season, there are a lot of dried leaves on the forest floor. So these butterflies are uh, usually flying close to the forest floor. They don't go into the canopy. So when they are resting and when there's dried leaf uh, in their background, this morph is more cryptic. And so there are two different strategies. One is using eye spots to deflect attacks. Another is relying only on crypsis. During the wet season, they cannot rely on crypsis. Imagine if they got rid of the eye spots. Because the background is green, they're still quite visible. They're still conspicuous, which is why they seem to have a different strategy. And this seems to be controlled by the environmental conditions under which the larva or the caterpillar grows. So during the dry season, during that uh, period, the temperatures will be different, the humidity will be different compared to that in the wet season. And several experiments have been done. And what researchers have found is that under lab conditions, if you grow them at high temperatures, let's say uh, temperatures for about 27 or 28 degrees, you tend to get this morph, the one with ice spots. If you grow them at colder temperatures, they tend to get, uh, they tend to grow into these kinds of morphs, the ones without eye spots. And it turns out that in Africa, the place where Bicyclis aminana is uh, typically found and from which the founders of this population were collected, these experimental populations, uh, the wet season has higher temperatures and the dry season has lower temperatures. So it seems like they're sensing temperature and they are using that as a cue to develop into an optimal phenotype for their future stage, that is an adult stage. This is yet another example of phenotypic plasticity. Again, you can take eggs from the same bags, divide them into two groups, grow them under two temperatures, you end up getting two different morphs. Here's another familiar example. Uh, you all have heard about the caste system in uh, social insects. 
So in bees, for example, you have the workers and queens. They can be genetically identical, but depending on the diet, one of them can become a queen. And there are many other examples of plasticity in uh, phenotypic plasticity in social insects. Uh, a very famous example is that of locusts. So these are grasshoppers. And when the densities are low, they are solitary. So they, li they live alone, they feed on plants and so on. When the densities go up, what happens is that they come in contact with each other. They come in physical contact with each other simply because of increased density. So they tend to touch each other and that triggers a developmental change and they end up becoming gregarious. Gregarious means group living. And the behavior changes, the hormone levels change, the physiology changes. There's several other changes. They become, the color pattern changes and they become such a huge pest to humans. You know, they congregate in large numbers and they start flying and they feed on just about anything they see, any plants they see. And they're a major pest in agricultural crops. So interestingly, here the trigger is physical contact and we can induce this under lab conditions. Uh, one can take a, a brush and gently rub their legs and they fold into thinking that, you know, this is physical contact with another locust and that can induce a change from this morph to another morph. So we've talked about, uh, well, in your classes, I'm sure you'll have talked about Mendelian inheritance, the concept of genes and so on. We study that the phenotype is controlled by the genetic material, by the genome. So there are genes responsible for different traits and so on. Uh, Mendel is famous for his work on peace. So he looked at their you know, the shape, color, size, and a whole lot of other things. So we know quite a lot about Mendelian inheritance, the concept of genes and so on. But now we're talking about something very different. We're talking about the same genotype producing different morphs. In all these examples, you see that the genotype is different, you get different morphs. But how does this happen? How do you get different phenotypes from the same genotype? In fact, this is very common. The same genotype can express different phenotypes. It happens all the time. We all know of multiple examples. Uh, some of you will have studied that the phenotype you know, uh, is determined by the genotype plus the environment plus the genotype by environment interactions. You can ignore this one, G by E for now. So even if you take the first part, the phenotype is controlled by the genotype and the effect of the environment. So when you talk of phenotypic plasticity, we are talking about the effect of the environment. So when an organism is developing, when the gene expresses the phenotype, there are various things that are influencing this phenotype expression. So all these things, developmental, physiological, metabolic processes, are sensitive to some degree to environmental variables. So which is one reason why most phenotypes tend to be plastic. So there is some change usually. So for example, take this image on the right hand side. It's the same plant. In fact, uh, in this particular case, they're clones. When grown under high light conditions, you know, bright sunlight, they grow into larger plants. They have more leaves, they grow, there's more biomass. When you give them restricted light, they're more stunted. The biomass is less. I mean, it's, it's natural because they, they can't photosynthesize well enough. So they're more stunted. Remember, these are the same genotype. 
yet you have two different phenotypes. Okay? So this is very similar to what's happening in the case of locusts or the bicyclists and nana eye spots and so on, in the sense that the genotype is affected by the environment. Rather, the phenotype expressed is affected by the environment. But in this case, it may or may not be adaptive, but previously masquerade and so on, we talked about examples where phenotypic plasticity itself is adaptive. Again, uh, in plants, heterophily is very common. Heterophily is where there's variation in leaf shape, leaf morphology. So for example, in this plant, when grown under a particular set of temperatures, the leaf looks like this. Other temperatures, they look like this. And this is uh, this also is able to survive under water. Under water, when it's submerged under water, the leaves look very different. Again, in this case, it's not clear whether the, the phenotypic plasticity is adaptive. So how do we know whether a phenotype is totally genetically determined? or whether it's plastic. So there's a, a question in the chat book, is it, it epigenetics? So I don't want to talk about epigenetics. In a lot of the examples of phenotypic plasticity, like social insects and so on, there is a component of, there is an influence of epigenetics. For now, I'm keeping that aside. Okay, Let, for now I'm talking about being purely genetically determined versus being phenotypically plastic. Just it uh, simple. For that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there was another question. So since grasshoppers seem to be brushing against all sorts of things in nature, how does rubbing with a brush help? So in that particular case, it's some part of the, uh, it doesn't mean that you take a brush and randomly rub them anywhere, they change phenotype. So it's a particular part of their, I think it's a femur, and I'm sure there's some frequency with which you need to rub and so on. You can't, and I mean, not every brush will help. So it's not random, it is fairly specific, but it's not so specific that we can't mimic it in the lab. Okay. Now, how do we determine whether the phenotype is uh, because of phenotypic plasticity or because of genetic determination. So if you have clones, obviously you can, you can take the clones and expose them to different environments and see what happens. Uh, under the different environments, if they still give you the same phenotype, then it seems it would, you probably would conclude that uh, at least that, and they are not sensitive to at least that particular set of environments. So clones are not easy to obtain in all cases. So in that case, what you could do is you could take a bunch of individuals and randomize them across two different environmental groups, two different environmental treatments. For example, you, take, you could take a bunch of eggs from the same mother and divide them under two different conditions and uh, two different environmental conditions and see whether phenotype changes. Or let's say you have a bunch of seeds of a plant. You collect them from the wild. You collect a thousand seeds and divide them into two groups randomly. Uh, 500 of them you grow under low temperature, the other 500 at high temperature and see whether there's a difference in phenotype. At the other end of the spectrum, let's say you observe variation in nature. Let's say you go to a, a, a grassland and a particular plant, you see they're of two different heights. You have some plants which are tall, the other plants are very short, stunted. And now you're wondering whether this is phenotypic plasticity. It could be that you know the ones that are growing under a particular micro environment tend to be taller, but the other ones are shorter. So now you want to find out whether this is phenotypic plasticity or whether these are different genetically. What you could do is bring them back to the lab or find another condition uh, which is in which you can grow them under 
common garden conditions. A common garden condition is basically not just for plants, you can, I mean, common garden experiments, you can use it even for animals and so on. So basically what you do is you take two different populations and grow them under the same conditions. So now, in this case, you took the plants of the tall morph and the short morph, take the seeds, grow them under either the lab conditions or somewhere else where you can control the environment. If you still find these two different morphs, it will tell you that this is genetically determined. This variation is genetically determined. But under common garden conditions, if you lose that variation seen in nature, then you can conclude that this is because of phenotypic plasticity. So what kind of phenotypes are plastic? Just about any phenotype is plastic. Morphology, appearance, you could have size, uh, shape, color, all kinds of things. Physiology, behavior, you know, behavior is a complex phenotype that can also be plastic. Here's an example of phenotypic plasticity in behavior. I already talked about the eye spots, uh, the wet and dry season morphs. So this is a wet season morph and this is a dry season morph of Bicyclus aninana. So these were the ventral sites. So this is the butterfly at rest. So what we see is a below, below part, so to say, the ventral side. And on the upper side, they look like this. So this is a wet season morph and this is a dry season morph. You see that there's no significant or remarkable plasticity on the upper surface. So they have very few eye spots. So they have this eye spot in this position and the size seems to be approximately the same. There is some variation, but it's approximately the same. So in the wet season, the females use the size of this little dot. So this little white dot is UV reflective. It, it, it reflects ultraviolet uh, radiation. And well, of course, other parts of the light spectrum as well. So this part is used by females as a sexual signal. So females prefer males that have intermediate white spots. So they don't like males which have very large spots or males that have very small spots. So for those of you who have studied basic evolution, this is an example of stabilizing selection where the intermediates are favored. So that's what the females do. The males don't care. They don't seem to use the spots as a signal. But in the dry season, surprisingly, the males use the spot size in females as a sexual signal. So they become choosy. And the females don't seem to care so much. So this behavior of choosing mates itself seems to be plastic. And again, you can induce this by growing them under different temperatures. You grow them at high temperatures, you get this phenotype on the ventral side, which is the underside, but you get this behavior where females are choosing, but at low temperatures, you can get males which are choosing. Uh, there's no good explanation for why this is uh, there in nature. It, we don't really know, but it's there. It's a very striking thing, which has been shown multiple times in the lab. Very, very interesting case of phenotypic plasticity. In fact, we've been talking about two kinds of plasticity. In the case of the larval morphs of uh, the masquerading caterpillar, Nemoria resonaria, and in the case of Bicyclis aminana here, so the plasticity is not reversible. So once the adult wing patterns are formed, they have that for the rest of their lifespan. 
but there are other examples of plasticity plasticity which is reversible so some people call this flexibility okay of course there are others who would find a difference between reversible plasticity and flexibility but i will not get into that now let's take acclimatization as mountaineers go higher and higher they don't keep on climbing continuously they take breaks they let their body acclimatize to the low oxygen concentration the body gets used to this then they go higher right and when they're coming down from the mountain the body again adjusts to increasing oxygen concentration here the phenotype is not clear is is not visible to us the change in phenotype is not visible to us but this would be an example where the physiology is changing right uh, obviously when the mountaineer is climbing up his or her genotype is not changing learning right there are changes there are chemical changes in our brains and that is a result of the environment we see something we're exposed to something there are changes in the brain and these can be reverted back to an original state so that would also be an example of phenotypic plasticity except that in this case it's reversible within the same uh, individual in the same lifespan the phenotype can go back and forth i talked about genetic determination versus plasticity but it's important to remember that a phenotype is not necessarily always 100% genetically determined or 100% determined by the environment obviously nothing can be 100% plastic if you were to feed me oak catkins all the time it doesn't mean that i will turn into a caterpillar mimicking a catkin right so my genotype is different from that of the caterpillar so this is an extreme example but again within the same population as well you can have variation so let's take skin coloration so this seems to be controlled by genetics to a large extent right but on the other hand if you take me and let me stand in the sun for several hours bright sun if i stand there my skin would turn a little darker whenever wherever it's exposed to the sun it will turn a little darker so it's controlled by the environment rather environment has an influence to a certain degree but it's largely genetically controlled and phenotypes range along the spectrum from being completely uh, one end of the spectrum completely genetically determined uh, and towards the other end of the spectrum a large influence of the environment now i touched upon this a little bit but now i'll talk about it in a little more detail so plasticity is pervasive it's everywhere right and when do we call it adaptive so obviously to determine whether it's adaptive you will need to do some experiments so you need to uh you know you need to see which phenotypes are produced in the different environments and you have to take the phenotypes put them under different environments and see where, where their fitness is highest you can look at survival reproduction and so on so i mean that's the ultimate way to test whether something is adaptive or not right so uh obviously in in many cases you don't do it you kind of make assumptions for example in the case of masquerade and so on you can perhaps make an assumption that it is adaptive so for plasticity to be adaptive you need to have at least two conditions one is the environment should be heterogeneous so a heterogeneous environment means the environment has at least two different types right so if there is only a one single environment then plasticity is not needed it's not going to be of any 
benefit, right? In the same environment, if you have two different morphs, right? And one morph has a slightly higher thickness, you expect that that morph which has a higher thickness will be selected for, and that will completely take over and the plasticity is lost. So in other words, the phenotype should lose their sensitivity to the environment. Then you also have need to meet the criterion that the phenotypes have the highest fitness in their respective environment. So what is the respective environment? Here, the wet season morph, its respective environment is you know, the background. In terms of predation, the background color is an important component of environment. So in this particular environment, this phenotype has a higher fitness compared to this phenotype. Conversely, under this environment of brown leaves, this phenotype has a higher fitness compared to this one. Okay, so this is a nece another necessary condition of uh, another condition for it to be called adaptive phenotypic plasticity. In other cases, for example, here and so on, it's not really clear whether it's adaptive. It could be depending on what you're measuring and so on, but it's not always very clear. I'll take you through a few more examples. This is a barnacle, aquatic organism, and its predator is, well, one of its predators is this snail. So in waters where there's, where the predators are present, these barnacles can sense the presence of their predators through chemical cues. Some chemicals released by these predators are sensed by these barnacles. And if the predators are present, and if the chemical cues are present, they develop into this morph. So this is their opening the aperture. You can, and this is the surface on which, the rock surface on which they're formed. So you see that the aperture is perpendicular to the rock surface. And this is the, if you want to call this normal morph, you're free to, but this is a morph which you see when there are no predators. So the aperture is parallel to the rock surface. So you have two morphs and when predators are present, this is an advantage because the, this morph is more resistant to predation by this snake. In these water fleas, Daphnia. Again, the presence of predators, these are chemical cues. This can induce differences in morphology. So here on the left, you have the morph that grow that develops when there are no predators. When there are predators, they have this large, you know, head is much larger. In some cases, they have a helmet-like structure. Here they have some kind of spines on the neck when predators are present. In this case, again, their head becomes much larger, which gives them more protection. And they also have these tails and these spikes on the head and so on, depending on the species. And interestingly, in this particular species, when fish are present, so fish are one of their predators, when fish are present, they tend to have smaller offspring. When midges are present, they tend to have larger offspring. Uh, this, both fish and midges are predators. So it seems to be because midges and fish have different preferences in terms of size of prey. Now, if we plot the phenotype on the y-axis, so let's take helmet in a particular water flea, Daphnia. And on the x-axis, let's plot the concentration of the chemicals from the predators. Okay. So if you find this kind of relationship where as the concentration increases, the helmet size increases continuously, 
this would be the reaction norm for helmet height. Okay, a reaction norm is basically it's a depiction of the range of phenotypes produced by a particular genotype when it's exposed to multiple environments. Or if you talk of single environmental variable, you can talk of temperature, for example. If on the x-axis, you could have a range of values for that parameter, that is temperature. So here are reaction norms, hypothetical ones. So A, B, and C are different genotypes. And here is one environment that varies. You can think of temperature, increasing temperature. And if you look at B, with increasing temperature, the value of B increases. So this could be I spot size in bicyclists and in army. For A, value decreases. So both A and B are phenotypically plastic. Okay. At least the phenotypes that you get are phenotypically are plastic. On the other hand, if you take genotype C, you see that the phenotype is constant. The phenotypic value does not change for all values of the environmental variable. So we say that C is not plastic. It's all, you can say that it's robust to the environment. Here, you have two genotypes, B and D. B is the same as what you see here. If you compare D and B, you see that D has a steeper slope, right? So a steeper slope indicates that it has greater sensitivity towards the environment. Polyphenism is a special case of phenotypic plasticity where the phenotypes are discrete or discontinuous. So in, in this case, if you had, or for example, if you take this case, the phenotype varies continuously. But if you think of the Nemoria arizonaria morphs, you have two discontinuous or very discrete phenotypes. Okay? So I spot size, for example, is an example for a continuous, continuously variable, a varying trait. Now, polyphenisms are where you get discrete phenotypes. So caste and social insects are also an example. In uh, many reptiles, the sex or the gender itself is controlled by the environment. Rather, it's, it's not controlled, but the environment has a strong influence. For example, in many turtles, the depth at which the eggs incubate determines the sex. Okay? So there are temperature differences. The ones that are deep in the sand, they grow into one sex in this particular case. And the ones that are intermediate, they develop into another sex. And the ones that are closer to the surface develop into a, the other sex, which is a, basically the one that's also there at the bottom. So ba basically you have two different transition zones. So this is one example. There are other examples where there's a single transition zone and above a particular depth, they develop into a different sex. So in this case, if you define sex as a phenotype, that itself is phenotypically plastic. In fact, uh, the previous one was an example where it's not reversible. It's already determined, but uh, well, uh, this is also an example where it's, it, where it's not necessarily reversible, but in this particular case, during the adult stages, the sex can change. So in some fish, for example, if the sex ratio becomes very female biased, if there are a lot of females and very few males, some females can change the sex, the gonads, the reproductive system changes, and they can become fully functional males. Remember the genotype does not change at all. The environment has changed. In this case, the sex ratio, the operational sex ratio has changed and they end up developing into 
males. So there are examples of fish where it can go the other way around, where males can become females. And, and in this case, when females turn into males in this particular species, it's, it's not only because of uh, sex ratio differences, it can also happen with changes in age and size and so on. It's a very interesting system. I'm not sure whether in these cases it's reversible uh, in the sense that if a female turns into a male, can it turn back into a female? I'm not really sure, but it's possible in some cases. Now, I talked about polyphenisms. So how do you get these discrete phenotypes? In nature, the reaction norm itself may be continuous, but the environments are discrete. Right? So let's assume in the case of ice spots, the reaction norms is the reaction norm for ice spots is continuous. You have at in, as temperature increases, ice spot size increases. But under natural conditions, let's say only this sets of temperatures are found. In that case, you end up getting discrete phenotypes, and you would see it as a polyphenism. Right? On the other hand, the reaction norm itself can be discontinuous. In other words, you could have a threshold. Beyond this threshold, you could get a different phenotype. So this happens quite often when hormones are involved. When, there's a, when the hormone levels cross a particular threshold, you get a very different phenotype. So it could happen, for example, in the case of sex change or fish. So there is a particular threshold, it could be a particular hormone, beyond a particular level, they suddenly develop into males. This is another temperate butterfly. This also has uh, spring and summer moths, and this has been shown to be an example of phenotypic plasticity. In the spring, they're brightly colored. In summer, they're much more dull. And this has been shown to be linked to day length. So uh, in this butterfly is found in Europe. So in Europe, so the day length varies much more dramatically compared to that in India. Even in India, the day length variation across the year, it's much less in uh, Bangalore and Trivandrum compared to what you see in Kashmir, for example. Now, so during this spring, the day length is going to be different. During summer, the day length is going to be different. It's going to be longer. And this seems to be related to the phenotype. Under lab conditions, you can grow them in long day length conditions and you can get this morph. Natural conditions, you see only these two moths, but under lab conditions, you get an entire range of phenotypes. So this is in fact, uh, where you have a continuous reaction norm, but you have a polyphenism in nature simply because the environments in nature are discrete. So coming towards the end, I'll very quickly go through some of the work we have done in the lab without going into details. So one of my PhD students got interested in plasticity in pupil color in this butterfly. So in the lab, we found both green and brown. So we did some tests and we found that this was not because of genetic control. So it seems to be phenotypically plastic. And there seemed to be a pattern where the green ones tended to be found on leaves and the brown ones tended to be on the branch on the on the main stem, or when we grew them under lab conditions on pots and other artificial surfaces. So we looked at this in a little more detail. And so as you can see in this case, the green one is better camouflage against a green background. Well, this is intuitive. And if it's on the stems, the background is likely to be brown. Okay. And the background also includes soil, rock, and other things. Right? So you expect that this is adaptive, although we've not been able to show this, you can intuitively expect that this is adaptive. So we tested whether 
the proportion of green and brown pupae varies with RH. RH is relative humidity, which is uh, which tells you how moist the air is. So when we grow them at low RH conditions, in other words, dry conditions, you get a little more brown pupae. It's not a huge difference, but there is a difference. So perhaps during the dry season, there's a higher tendency to have brown pupae because the background has a lot of dried leaves and so on. So this is better camouflaged. More importantly, what we found is that uh, the color correlates with substrate. So in both these cases, you have the brown pupae here and you have green pupae. Uh, the hatchings indicate that the, pu the pupa pupated away from leaves. Okay? So in the case of brown, you see that almost all pupae, they pupate away from leaves. But in the case of green pupae, most of them pupate on the leaves, while a few pupate away from leaves. Okay? So this is what you would expect if this is adaptive. And we grow them at different densities. In the lab, we did this in growth chambers and the controlled conditions and in terrace conditions. What we find is that when we grow them at high densities, you get more brown pupae. In other words, there's a greater tendency to be brown. So our interpretation is that when the densities are high, so they're probably forced to pupate away from the leaves. And now that they're forced to pupate away from the leaves, there, they have an advantage in being brown. Uh, I'll just show this. And we also looked at a bunch of related species. So we have this nice uh, comparison. So in the same community, all these butterflies, including the previous one, Michaelis minions, they all feed on grasses. The, the larval stages feed on grasses. So in the same community of grass feeding butterflies, we have differences in pupil plasticity. So you have two species which have only green pupae. You have one species which feeds, which feeds on grasses and has only brown pupae. And of course you have Michaelis minius and this other species which have both green and brown morphs. So we wanted to look at pupation patterns. Where do they tend to pupate? So on the right hand side, we have pupil color. So you have two, and each bar represents a species. And this is a proportion. You can see two species which have only green. In other words, they don't have pupil color plasticity. There is one species which has only brown. There are two species which have both green and brown and different proportions. And there's a nice correlation. The species which have only green pupae they pupate almost exclusively on, well, they pupate predominantly on leaves. So there's a very small proportion that are away from the leaves. If you take the brown species, so this pupates predominantly on off leaf substrates, on the soil, the rock, stem and so on, very few of them on leaves. In the two species which have both green and brown pupae, you can see that the one that has a higher proportion of brown tends to have a higher proportion of off-leaf pupation. The other one has a smaller, a smaller proportion of off-leaf pupating pupae. So there's a very nice correlation between the color of the pupae and their pupation behavior, where they choose to pupate. And in another butterfly, we have found that pupil color is not just green and brown, but there's a continuous variation. So here we have the distribution of pupil color morphs in the wild. The red ones indicate what you find in the wild, and the green ones are what we grow, what we get when grown under lab conditions. As you can see, there's a continuous variation. The reaction norm seems to be continuous. It's not a polyphenism. Of course, it seems to be bio, bimodally distributed. That's interesting. So uh, 
In this case, rather than classifying them as green and brown, we calculated how green they are. So it's possible to use some metrics, rather we designed some metrics where you quantified color and we show that the pupae that are on the leaves, when they pupate on the leaves, they tend to be greener. On this axis, you have the greenness index. Higher values indicate that the pupae are more green. So for example, in this case, this would have a higher greenness index. So the ones that are pupating away from the leaves tend to have less greenness. In other words, they tend to be more brown. So this is a case both in the lab and in the white. What is more interesting is that in this butterfly, they seem to be able to sense how green a leaf is. So here you have each one represents a pupa that is formed on the leaves. On the x-axis, you have the greenness index for the leaf. On the y-axis, you have the greenness index of the pupa. Right? So there is a lot of scatter, but you see a general trend. As the leaves are more green, the pupae that are formed on them are also more green. It's, a, it's, it's not a very strong relationship, but still what this tells you is that the pupae, rather the, the butterflies are able to detect somehow how green a leaf is. And depending on that, they're able to modulate their own pupil color. Okay, so that's all I had. I finished one minute ahead of time, but uh, yeah. So I'd like to thank Harsha and Tarun who were involved in the work I presented very briefly and funding from DSG and ISA Tirunanthapur. Uh, thanks, Sulasa, for a very nice talk. Uh, you can see one question is there. Yeah, there's one question. How do they know the sex ratio, the fish? Yeah. Now, I think in this case, it should be fairly easy for them to figure out. See, they need to know the sex in order to mate. So they would be using morphology, hormones, a whole lot of things. So as long as they can identify sex, they should be able to get an estimate of sex ratio. Right? Or I mean, there could be other cues, probably hormone levels or something else in the water may also be involved. But in this case, I would say it's fairly easy. How does the pupa sense color? So in fact, the pupa itself doesn't sense the color. I corrected myself, I later said it was individuals. So the larvae are the ones that turn into Pupae. So the pupae, the larvae, just before pupation, they select their pupation substrate. And during that time, they somehow sense color. So we don't really know how it works. We're trying to figure that out in the lab. So in, in most species, it seems to be that. But it's in some species, it's also that after the pupate, the pupa can change color. So we don't really know exactly when they sense and this may differ across species and the exact sensory mechanism we are yet to figure out. Uh, Professor Indulika also has raised the hand. Can we go ahead and have a question? I, I was yeah. wondering whether this uh, responding to greenness and greenness Whether uh, 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 it could be okay, such a phenomenon could be seen if we change the temperature to you know summer temperature to winter temperature artificially. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so one thing is they may be using temperature itself as a cue to figure out the general environment. For example, pupae if it's very warm, they might decide that. You know, the background, it's called, well, it's not decision. I use the term very loosely. It's not that they're thinking and deciding, but they may have evolved use temperature as a cue to uh, temperature. They may use temperature as a proxy to sense their 
background environment and hence the color. For example, in the case of butterfly eye spots. But I think what you're asking is whether the temperature itself can uh, affect their sensitivity to color. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, if you artificially change the, kind of, you know, the temperature, but not the color. Okay. Or, or color of the leaves. Or yeah, I mean, it, temperature may have an effect. We have not detected it in the lab, but on the other hand, we don't, we have not grown them under very vastly differing temperatures. So perhaps they use temperature as one of the cues, uh, which modulates their phenotype perhaps, but uh, we have not tested because so far we have not really suspected temperature to be so important, but it's possible definitely. I was asking in the context of climate change. Asking in the context of climate change. Yeah, it's a very pertinent question. So uh, rather than pupil color plasticity, I probably should talk about butterfly eye spots because their temperature has been shown to be uh, an environmental cue that the butterflies use. Yes, what will happen as the climate changes? So if it happens slowly, given enough time, one might expect that the reaction norms itself will evolve. The reaction norm to temperature may evolve such that, you know, today, when they, if they produce a wet season morph at say 27 degrees, after 100 or 200 years, selection by predators can exert an influence on the reaction norm such that they will produce this morph only at 29 degrees because global temperatures have changed and the, the background and so on will change. It's possible that it can go that way. It's possible that they're not able to adapt to changing temperatures. The worst case is that they may go extinct, right? So it can go in multiple ways. It's hard to predict, but one thing, as a general comment, uh, what I can uh, say is that when there is phenotypic plasticity, they have a higher chance of adapting to changing environments, very broadly speaking. So when we talk of changing environments, climate change included. So as long as there's phenotypic plasticity, a lot of the things, a lot of their phenotypes can adapt to different, to increasing temperature. That's the expectation. Uh, can I ask one more question? Yeah, sure. Do you see any differences in this ability for in this plasticity between, say, arthropods and in mammals, for example? Well, plasticity is pervasive. It's it's in all animals and plants. And I don't know about arthropods and invertebrates. A lot of experiments have been done with invertebrates simply because they're easy to study. But I don't expect any broad differences between arthropods and invertebrates. On the other hand, there's an interesting uh, comparison between plants and animals. Because animals can move away. If the environment is not favorable, a lot of animals can move away, but plants cannot do that. Most plants are fixed to that particular spot. So perhaps plants are more prone to have plasticity, more prone to have adaptive plasticity. Uh, well, there's no, very, there's no big difference between plants and animals, but that's one expectation. There's an interesting paper uh, written by Professor Rene Borges about this. Thank you. So there's a question. Sorry. Uh, there's a question in the chat box. When the pupa changes color, is there any similarity to the sensing mechanism of the chameleon? Could be, but vertebrate sensory mechanisms are quite different. 
compared to invertebrate sensory mechanisms. And the larvae don't really have eyes. The adult butterflies do have eyes, intricate compound eyes, but larvae have much reduced uh, visual processing systems. So what exactly they use, how they sense color, it's not clear. It's also possible that they're using some other proxy. For example, younger leaves may be brighter, older leaves may be darker, and younger leaves may have a different texture. So there's a possibility which we don't exclude for the moment. Any other question from audience? I have just one general curiosity. It is not about the bio background. Is it okay to ask? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, uh, so in butterflies <laughs> patterns, right? So, in your maybe studying for the uh, effect of uh, environment or uh, other uh, factors. But if we keep all the factors identical in environment and then this butterfly's pattern on the which I see from my eyes that will remain same in the next generation or two butterfly will be same or for looking at yeah. yeah a lot of it is controlled by genes themselves genes themselves. So basically most of the colors that you see around us, the not most, a lot of them are controlled by the genes. So irrespective of environment you should see some color patterns that are always there. Mm -hmm. And there will be exceptions, for example, eye spots and so on, which are strongly influenced by the environment. So these are two ends of the spectrum, completely genetically controlled versus uh, being environmentally influenced strongly. Yeah. And the, uh, whenever I see any new light, the pattern on their uh... Uh, wings are always different. Is it uh, true or it is? Uh, so very broadly speaking, there are a lot of exceptions, but very broadly speaking, it depends on uh, what species. So within a given species, the color patterns uh, tend to have less variation, very little variation, but between species, they can vary quite a bit. So uh, I mean, there's no one single answer. It's it depends on basically it depends on whether they belong to the same species or they're different species. So around us you will see uh, the place where you are. They're close to three hundred butterflies species, butterfly species. So you will see a lot of diversity. Mm -hmm. But if you go to some areas, if you go to Iceland, for example, you will have just a few species. So you will see much less diversity in color pattern. Okay. Yes, sir. Can you go that slide where you've shown different pupa for different species? Okay, different. This one? No, 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 this one, this one, this one, yes. Yeah, so these uh, last, last two are looking same. <laughs> yeah, uh, they look the same, but uh, if you, Basically, it's not as strong as in the previous case, but still, I would still say this is greenish and this is brownish. So, yeah, it's not as striking as in other cases, but still, I would not call this green, for example, and I would not call this brown, for example. Right? And we also quantified color in this case, so we can quantify color and you, we, we see a strong bimodal pattern. So one peak will correspond to the brown ones, the other peak will correspond to the green ones. So it's kind of similar to the next case. So you see this bimodal distribution, except that these peaks will be much more distinct in that particular species. Oh, okay, sir. Thank you. Any other question from the audience? Uh, this is not a question really, just a curiosity about what's the photograph uh, behind you? 
What's the photograph behind me? Uh, I'm surprised you can see because it became so dark when I was sitting here, the clouds came in. So that's, uh, the, I guess you want the common name. It's a lace wing butterfly. It belongs to the genus Setosia. It's from Northeast India. But there are lace wings which are found in, the, there are lace wings of Western Ghats and Northeast India. So it's one of the lace wings. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Thank you. Uh, if there is any more question, let's thank the speaker. Okay, uh, with this, I would also like to thank all the afternoon speaker for their wonderful talks. Uh, uh, this session is closed, so I will... Uh, yeah, maybe uh, we'll ask uh, Indulekha and Suri to come, come in. Yeah. Indulekha? Yeah. So, uh, dear all, we are reaching the conclusion of this series of short trips across the beautiful landscape of knowledge of nature painted by science. It is time to express thanks on behalf of all the conveners, Professor Joy Mitra from Indian Institute of Science Education and Research, Tiruvananthapura, Professor Jasjit Bagla from Indian Institute of Science Education and Research, Mohali, and myself from the Mahatma Gandhi University, I thank you, dear students. You give meaning to and are the purpose of this exercise. Thank you for participating so enthusiastically. These lecture journeys were in celebration of 25 years of publication of Resonance, Journal of Science Education. This mode of celebration received all encouragement from the Indian Academy of Sciences, which publishes Resonance. The Academy co-publishes Resonance along with Springer Nature. On behalf of the conveners, I thank the Academy for all the encouragement given for the conduct of this lecture series. The Editorial Board of Resonance had approached Isar Thirman Program, requesting collaboration in the conduct of this lecture series. On behalf of the journal, I, one of the associate editors of Resonance, thank Isar Thirmanandapuram, particularly Director Professor J.N. Murthy, for the enthusiasm, time, and energy ISA TVM brought into and engaged in the planning and conduct of this lecture series. The editorial board had approached ISA Mohali requesting collaboration, and we are meeting and talking on the Zoom license to ISA Mohali, and the lectures are being live streamed on YouTube, posted on the website of ISA Mohali. On behalf of the journal, I thank ISA Mohali particularly the director, Professor J. Gauri Shankar, for the enthusiasm, time, and generosity Aysar Mohali brought into and engaged in the conduct of this lecture series. Our expert speakers gave guidance on these trips across the landscape of knowledge, showed as the known paths, gave hints of the rich terrains as yet unknown, and also showed how new paths are made. On behalf of the conveners, on behalf of all of us, I thank all the speakers. The chairs of the sessions kept this whole lecture series on track, gave clear thumbnail sketches of our expert speakers, took care that questions could be asked and that those which were asked were brought to the attention of the speaker and was vigilant so that we didn't lose track of time between the various trips. I thank all the chairs, particularly Asha Dond, Mahesh Hariharan, Manik Barnik, and Nisha Kannan from ISAR TVM and Ambre Shivaji from Aysar Mohani. Members of the editorial office at the Indian Academy of Sciences contributed greatly to the conduct of this lecture series. I particularly thank Mrs. Srimati, Executive Editor, Sri Mahesh Chandra, Executive Secretary, and Mrs. Pushpavalli and Mrs. Geeta from the editorial office for all their timely help. I hope I haven't left out anyone who had contributed greatly and should be thanked. I thank them too. I thank one and all and Punar Milama, maybe in person or more likely and most welcome there too, on screen or in print even via resonance. I know now thank over to sorry, I now hand over to Professor Suri, the chief editor of resonance. Thank you. You're muted, Suri. Again, again muted. Somehow it gets muted again. <laughs> Sorry, I had muted myself because it was echoing earlier. 
So I just wanted to end by saying a, a few small things about uh, the academy itself. The Indian, Indian Academy of Sciences mentions in its manifesto that it recognizes a special relationship of scientific creative activity with, with the process of education and holds that the course of discovery includes the identification and nurturing of scientific talent amongst the young. The Academy upholds that the principles of social responsibility for all scientific effort is entirely consistent with individual freedom and that the quest for knowledge and truth cannot be reconciled with any dogma. Uh, retaining a clear perspective for the nurturing of the scientific temper is of the utmost importance in a country beset with prejudices, rules and bureaucratic formalisms. It is of the greatest value that working scientists promote the principles of rational thought of function and relevance rather than precedence. By applying rigorous standards of scientific criticism at all levels in a constructive sense, the scientific community has a unique contribution to make not only to the flowering of science in India, but also to national character. This is the manifesto of the academy. Now, resonance being a journal that is functioning under the umbrella of the academy and particularly engages with young minds has a responsibility to uphold the above mentioned ideals. In this respect, apart from publishing articles, activities such as the present one play a very useful role. I believe students would agree that it has been a very productive five days. Uh, the students present uh, here are, of course, the UG students who attended the program only in the last three days. Uh, there were many illuminating talks on so many diverse topics, but a striking feature was that many speakers were able to bring about interrelations that could be perceived among many of these diverse themes. I am confident that the students would have found the whole experience uplifting and exciting and enthused them to continue asking questions and proceed with their curiosities all their lives. Uh, a Google form for their feedback, I think, I believe has been shared. On behalf of residents, it's a pleasure to thank all the people who made this event possible. As uh, Indulekha mentioned, apart from the participants themselves, the speakers, the chairs of sessions who worked the dynamics of the sessions, I would like to thank our convenience, Professor Sindhulekha, Mitra and Bagla, as well as Mrs. Srimati from the Academy. Last but not least, I acknowledge the, on behalf of Resonance, the continuous assistance provided throughout by Geeta and Pushpa from the Resonance team. So thank you, everyone. Happy Science Pursuit to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Suri.